What is up, Generals? We're back with Ultimate General Civil War, and uh, we're taking a look at the JNP Rebalance mod. So um, today's episode is going to be Cross Keys, um, and we're going to be uh, taking a little bit longer to do the battle than um, normal. Uh, normally, I do the play component of these videos in half speed, and uh, we're going to do the uh, play component at real time um, today. And the reason we're doing that is I have a lot to talk about just in terms of the state of the series as well as, uh, you know, the life of the channel, that kind of deal. So um, let's talk a little bit about uh, what's, uh, what's going on. So it took me a long time to get past cross keys. Um, I think I ended up at 10 tries uh, on legendary before uh, I gave up. Um, I will be willing to revisit legendary at some juncture in the future. Uh, but at the moment, I don't think I have it in me. I don't know if it's the start I don't know if it's me, the player, uh, could be, you know, all of the above or none of the above. Um, and so what I did is I stepped the difficulty down to major general and I started a new, um, a new campaign. Um, this is major general. It's the Confederate side of the game. And instead of making you guys watch the first seven episodes all over again, um, in MG, I made a point of deliberately following the exact same strategies. Uh, I mean, the that intention starts to fall apart um, when uh, you take into account the actions of the enemy. I have to be reactive to what I'm seeing on the screen. But um, at the broad strokes level, uh, the plan for each individual battle was the same. Um, and you see on the screen at the moment, uh, I am currently alt tabbed looking up where Nathan Bedford Forrest is from. So he's from Tennessee apparently. Um, and so what I've done is I've rebuilt the army here, uh, to the same general model as what I had done, uh, before, um, with a couple of notable changes. The, the first one being that the career start that I, I had, uh, at the beginning of the campaign is <clears throat> um, quite a bit different. I, I think many of my difficulties at the MG playthrough were tied to uh, the high training start. And the reason that I think that that is the case is it takes the existing strength of the Confederate Army, which is the strength, the high training, um, relatively speaking, the high base stats of its units, and it just doubles down on on that particular strength um, while doing absolutely nothing to shore up uh, the weaknesses of uh, the Confederacy as a faction. So um, I think many of my difficulties that I experienced in the course of the legendary campaign, predominantly coming down to, uh, I would say, too little lethality and too poor access to high uh, lethality firearms. So that's my personal read on the failures of my previous venture going forth. Uh, and apologies here. I'm distracted apparently off screen having a conversation. I'm sure you can hear the, the, uh, what sounds like chat bubbles. Um, I'm likely having a conversation uh, it sounds like hangouts maybe. So I'm probably having a conversation about, about, uh, school stuff. Um, most of my professors are on Google hangouts. So instead of editing that stuff out, I'm actually going to use the time to chat and just give you a chance to look at the army. So the other cool thing that I've done is, uh, I know that ostensibly speaking, each of these units is supposed to be a brigade, which would not be named after an individual state and not honestly even numbered. Uh, individual brigades, to my knowledge, were named after their commanding officer on both sides of the war historically. Um, but because officers change pretty frequently here and I have a hard time tracking who is 
what officer um, or who is what brigade based on the officers associated therein. Uh, I instead, um, I instead, uh, I numbered them. I always have, I always have numbered them. I've always numbered them first. So the, the number numerology, if you're just now catching the series, is unstarred units are called militia. Um, and then when you hit your first star, you get upranked to infantry. Your second star upranks you to either rifles or grenadiers, depending. And then we kind of go from there. Um, so the other thing that I've done is that when I make a new unit or when I number an existing unit, I roll um, a, a die. It's a 2D, 2D6 um, on this chart that I put together. And it's weighted uh, slightly towards the more numerous or more populous states of the Confederacy. Um, but uh, theoretically speaking, you could roll, you know, um, the Arizona territories, which I did actually. <laughs> um, and so it's, it's a little bit more silly, dumb role playing. There's not really any tactical value to pretending that a brigade is composed of soldiers from a certain state, but, uh, I, I think it's fun. Um, and it's, you know, like uh, I, I've talked a lot in my videos and I don't have any expectation that you poor bastards would have would have watched, you know, all of my content up until this point. But I, I like a great deal of the fun finger quotes for me in this game is uh, the role play, telling a story. Um, and it's especially the, the trials and tribulations of the individual units um, is, is a huge, huge part of the game for me. So I'm doing this for me and whatever. Um, so, for example, I've got on the screen, I've got selected the 2nd South Carolina Rifles because they're a two-star unit. Um, right behind them is the 14th Arizona Infantry Brigade. They're my one of my newest units, and they have, uh, I believe, smooth bores in this particular battle. Um, and, uh, you know, I've done all that. Now, what I haven't done is I haven't named, as far as states are concerned, the artillery. Um and the reason being is that the artillery names are already kind of full enough as it is. So broadly speaking, I don't use an infantry brigade all that differently depending on what kind of gun it's got, with the exception of two guns, the Springfield 55 and the Reboard Musket. Um, I treat those guns as being fundamentally different in terms of their behavioral characteristics to any other rifled firearm. Um, obviously, there is a a statistically significant difference in the behavioral patterns of, for example, um, a, uh, an Enfield or a Lorenz over say, uh, a Springfield M4, M4, M 4 M for M eighteen forty one. But, um, they, as far as I'm concerned are roughly 40 ish percent accurate at maximum range. And that maximum range is, 400 their fire rate is roughly 100 and you get what i'm going for here like their behavioral characteristics and the manner that i actually care about is basically the same um the damage curve might be better on the newer guns whatever 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 i don't really care like it's it's better but it's not worth tracking in my mind however um <coughs> excuse me, the percussion musket, the rebore musket, and the 1855 Springfield all behave significantly differently than those guns. The Springfield 55 has a much higher rate of fire. Um, the smoothbore is a great melee weapon, but isn't actually all that good as far as a musket's concerned. Um, but I believe also has a, a pretty, like it's pretty dangerous at very point blank range. Like if you get right up in someone's grill, that smoothbore musket's going to really tear some holes in dudes. So it's, it's a good weapon. It's just maybe not, um, you know, it, it's, it's maybe not the kind of thing you'd equip to a, a, a sniper unit. So we're bringing two different artillery units here. Um, we've got a unit of Blake's and we've got a unit of Napoleon's. Um, and what's frustrating is even at major general, I had to play this battle cross keys. Like I beat I beat Shiloh the first time through. Uh, and Major General. Um, I even got a little cocky and said, oh, I, I feel like I'm steamrolling it. And, you know, because I steamrolled Shiloh um, to the point that we went to the second day, you know, and I, and I, I ground out kills and guns that way. Um, and then I got to this battle and it kicked my ass. 
kick my ass in legendary, kick my ass at major general. I tried dozens of strategies. I got super aggressive. I got really out there. I tried the, the meme on the internet is, you know, offense is best, right? So I, I tried being really aggressive and getting out there. Um, and it, it didn't work. And then uh, I tried this strategy, which which I say try, but like this is the strategy that I used back in the day when I played this game in vanilla or the UI mod. This was the strat that I used for this battle is is draw them into the center fight here, have them supported with uh, two or three brigades of infantry in the middle here with uh, 24 pound howitzers or, or some sort of Napoleon, some sort of smoothbore gun and then use the positions where I've got the 2nd Tennessee Long Rifles and uh, the 11th Mississippi Infantry and use them as sort of a spoiler for any kind of offensive action the enemy might take towards the center. With the knowledge that the AI is going to sort of beeline towards this northern flag. And there might be um, a concerted effort to try and move on the southern flag as well, but it's not going to be the main thrust. And I'm frustrated because that's exactly what I tried to do at Legendary and it just didn't work. And um, what's frustrating is that <clears throat> I tried all these different <laughs> like variations on the strategy uh, at the Major General level and they more or less also didn't work. And what finally worked is just going back to the vanilla strategy of camping a little bit behind the flag in the middle um, trusting in a two-star rifled infantry unit down here to just these three brigades to operate largely independently and hold the southern flag by themselves. And then the secret ingredient was, interestingly, not more infantry. Up until now, at least at legendary difficulty, the answer to most of my problems has always been more line infantry. Not because line infantry is particularly lethal, but because line infantry scares the AI into not charging as much. And if they see this solid block of riflemen or heavy infantry, um, they're less inclined to launch themselves callously into the fray. So, it in the proviso that if you can get into preferential territory, you can trade effectively with an a, a Union AI or a Confederate AI if you're playing the Union, um, that infantry utilized intelligently can trade effectively. They might take casualties, you almost certainly will, but um, actually no, you with a certainty, comma, will. Um, you can trade effectively, three to one, four to one, five to one, those kinds of trades are profitable, maybe barely in some cases, but they are. Many of the playthroughs or attempts that I made on Legendary achieved very favorable kill ratios, 4 to 1, 5 to 1, in the case of the units that were forward deployed, and they were engaging Union troops who were completely in the open, totally exposed, uh, suffering just massive losses for each volley, but... The difference is that with the aggression and the morale modifiers and so forth, mor morale recovery modifiers, that legendary, they didn't give a shit. They were like, yeah, no, it's all good. We didn't like those 200 guys anyway, apparently. <laughs> and they're, they're just happy to take it. So uh, I tried this battle a couple of times with an increasing amount of infantry, and I was frustrated because I was encountering less and less success. The more riflemen I, I brought to the situation. And so... Uh, I reassessed, took a step back, and I was like, okay, clearly more riflemen is not the right answer. More line infantry is not the correct answer to this problem. Um, let's take a step back and, and let's do some research. So I went and I watched Panda's videos. I went and I watched my old video from the last time I played this game on, um, on Vanilla at MG. And uh, I, I, I watched... I think something Compass's video back in the day, like I was vexed. I was genuinely, truly, honestly vexed by this battle. I can't figure it out. The difficulty spike was huge. I couldn't get over the hump. And I was like, look, this campaign isn't going to go anywhere if I can't get past cross keys. And if you can't get past cross keys, like, should you be playing this game? <laughs> like, should you be making YouTube videos about this game if you can't get past cross keys? So the answer was to go back to the drawing board and rebuild from the ground up a combined arms army. A little bit of counter infantry, a little bit of counter battery, enough of a foundation of line infantry to hold the line, so to speak. And then the secret ingredient was cavalry. 
and specifically uh, Forrest's um, Second Tennessee Dragoons. Uh, Three Star Cavalry is broken as all hell. I mean, it's not broken in my mind because yeah, it's very good, but the investment to get a unit to three stars, especially cavalry, is phenomenal. Like it's 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 very hard to get a unit to three stars of of cavalry. Um, now you beat Shiloh, and the game gives you a three star cav unit. All right, fine, sure, that's true. Um, you beat. Uh, what is it that the Union, they give you the, the uh, is it the Irish Brigade or the Iron Brigade? It's an I something, something, something brigade. Whichever brigade they give you is a three-star infantry brigade, which is generally considered to be more useful than the cavalry brigade that you get here. Especially because Forrest's brigade spawns with, like, shotguns, um, and it, you have no control over the perks that it comes with. And, uh, in the vanilla base game, okay, well, whatever, you get perks. Um, in the rebalance mod, those perks are like a significant portion of how the unit fights. But the stats are also stupid. And so I trusted in the stats. Given um, the perk breakdown that I got with uh, Forest, Second Tennessee, Dra Second Tennessee Dragoons, I decided to make them a Dragoon unit because the first perk they got was plus 75% accuracy. The second and third perks, however, were speed um, and, and melee oriented perks, which um, is, a, is a weird combo to, to get in that unit, obviously. So I gave them Cookin' Brothers because the Cookin' Brothers is just an excellent cavalry carbine. It's a fantastic weapon. Um, it's got great accuracy, which is going to double down with their, you know, firearms in the mid nineties very well. Um, and it's going to let the unit kind of do well, but I also use them as this backfield brute, brute squad. And because they're three stars, I can trust them to do this mostly on their own. Whereas if it was a, a one star or a two star unit, I'd probably need to double up. Um, I mean, yeah, they, they handle an entire battery of artillery without taking a single loss in the process. Um, and I'm able to do the, the exact same thing again. So um, utilizing that sort of aggressive element of the army to remove the uh, backfield support from uh, the Union here was instrumental in uh, reducing their ability to effectively fight offensively. So let's take a little bit of a time to talk about what I'm doing here on the battlefield. Broadly speaking, I'm trying to draw them in to an engagement in the center, hopefully over committing and fighting in places where they're going to be in the open and I can get flank shots on them. Especially uh, some, some of the real rock stars on this battle are uh, the second South Carolina rifles. Um, the Texas infantry here does a great job tying up uh, Bowden, Bolden, this guy right down here that I'm looking at right now, him. Uh, they do a great job tying him up, but he he's a continuous thorn in my side this whole time. I don't know where exactly that unit of his is positioning, but it's getting, like, it's, it's not taking the kinds of losses I feel like it should be taking from two different brigades shooting at it in the open. So it's almost certainly got some kind of cover, and I just can't see... Like maybe it's in the cornfield or maybe it's it's near enough that it's got its tippy toe in that house there to the bottom of the map. And so it's getting some house cover. I'm not really sure. But the majority of their army, as you can see, is on the Union side of the river or very many of them are actually in the river. And then this sort of task force to the north here, uh, composed of the uh, Tennessee Long Rifles and uh, who are not going to be long term um they're, they're, the, the Tennessee Light Infantry are not long-term going to be sniper boys. Um, and the reason I say that is that unit was intended to be um, general rangers, general um, light infantry. So they have uh, that perk um, that's plus 50% accuracy and then a reduction to reload time and also a morale fire damage received. Um, but the unit whose purpose it is to ultimately become a sniper unit had, and I kid you not, they had five too many soldiers. 
<laughs> to give them um, my scope Whitworths. And uh, I tried running this battle a couple of times with like just regular Whitworths or maybe Springfield 61s or something. And it wasn't, it wasn't enough. I need apparently that extra bit of rain to take out some of these artillery units. So um, the Tennessee boys here are temporarily borrowing the scope Whitworths, even though that's not the intention. So in a macro sense, you see what's happening here is as the army continues, the Union army continues to try and push aggressively towards this northern flag and they keep getting blasted back. Um, sorry, I'm off topic. So the task force to the north is intended to do exactly what it's doing. It's push the Union command south into that killing field immediately in front of um, the South Carolina rifles. And uh, it's just wide open terrain. They suck up a lot of condition crossing that river. They've got you know no cover. They're coming uphill ever so slightly, all that kind of stuff. There's a dozen different factors leading into them sucking up a lot of casualties coming up that, um, that little bit of terrain there. And I'm working on trying to knock out uh, Drayton's battery. That's the big kind of focus because you notice the second Tennessee Dragoons have now forest forest guys they've now knocked out two batteries um, for a grand total of two losses incredibly good trade right they've the, those it's fantastic uh, return on investment for those two guys we also stole a supply wagon which is a good time um, <clears throat> so the the rest of their army is being pushed into the open here um, it they, they have there's a real risk of them murder balling and charging and they tried uh, at second South Carolina's so um, I run the Virginia rifles northward to join them and so now there's two two-star rifle units uh, plus a Blake battery blasting these brigades um, and for the most part I'm able to cancel these charges um, but at a certain juncture, the AI hits this point where they're like, no, we're not going to, we're not going to give up. We're going to keep charging. And so they get to this point where they're like, we're, we're in it to win it. We're going all in. And, uh, at a certain juncture, I hit this threshold where I'm like, fine, if you want to melee, let's melee. Let's just make sure I do it on the right terms. So, um, I guess that's one of the other lessons is like, don't be afraid of melee. I'm, I'm generally afraid of melee. I'd much prefer to shoot. I think, um, Winning these battles via fire as a maneuver is cleaner uh, across the board than doing it in shock. Um, but it, it seems as if the AI at any difficulty is determined to try and launch um, <clears throat> launch themselves in a melee. So, for example, Beal. I think I'm, I'm pretty sure it's been a while, but I'm pretty sure Beal decides to make this charge. Like he's 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 down. He takes the volley and doesn't seem to care. So, um, eventually I figure, well, crossing that kind of a distance, Beal must have sucked up a lot of his condition. And the Virginia rifles actually have a decent melee stat. Uh, plus they're fresh, they're in good condition, all that kind of stuff. So I say, screw it, let's go. And, and they go in there and they just tear Beal a new one. And it's great. <clears throat> Yeah, so at this juncture, I realize Beal's going to do it. Like, he's, con he's convinced he's going to do the thing. Uh, and they're going to take that supply wagon, and they're going to push me to the point where I'm out of cover at a certain juncture. So I'm like, screw it. Let's go and let's get him. And he has tired himself out. He's worn himself out, and he just gets torn to pieces. Apparently, the... Virginia boys, despite having both of their perks exclusively t geared towards shooting stuff, uh, are just fine hitting stuff with the back of a rifle. Uh, they fix bayonets and they're good, you know, no problem. Uh, we get this unit here on the north. Uh, I can't read it from here, unfortunately, but it's, it's an M word. Um, they're like going to squirt out of the combat, Milroy, I think. They're going to squirt out of the major major battle, and the units that do that are actually a big problem. Um. So they squirt out of the main region of engagement, and I'm sort of squeezing the vice of the rest of my army around them. Um, they're gonna kind of pop out the other side, so I mount up. I mount up Forest, and I say, "Okay, well, go ahead and and 
utilize the fact that routing units have a significant debuff to their melee stat and get in there and get some kills. So they're going to do exactly that. Uh, and I'm hoping to shatter the unit or ideally capture it because 800 and... 50 some odd men as captures would be a great, you know, great boon for the army. No luck, unfortunately. Um, but, uh, they, they seem content to suffer horrendous losses and uh, continue fighting for the cause of the Union. <laughs> so off they go. Um, so, uh, and we're closing the vice around the rest of the army here, and and this is a way to handle this battle. Uh, Johnny and Panda and Hussar were all great about offering me some suggestions about how to handle this fight. They were very helpful when I was, um, you know, griping. But uh, eight attempts at legendary, I decided to just call it. Uh, and I, I rage quit a couple of times in this battle. I, I have since deleted the recording, but there's a point where I was playing this and I, you know, I, I, everything was going my way and my units were still getting ground down, right? There was one legendary playthrough. The, the battle had gone perfectly insofar as the union was stuck in the open. They lacked the mobility or the offensive push to do anything. They weren't charging. They were just standing there in the open, um, getting just slaughtered. Their artillery had been destroyed. I'd gotten around their rear. I was causing things to chain route um, by, you know, flank fires and, and, and that kind of deal. And all of my units, despite all of that, despite everything going basically perfectly, um, and, and, and I was going to win the battle. Like I want to classify this as I was going to win the battle despite, well, maybe, I don't know. I ended up rage quitting before I got there. All of my units were at 70 plus percent casualties. All of them. Um, we we traded very effectively, but the army was so much larger than mine that it didn't make a difference. And when my two-star units shattered because they just got shot enough that they were like, I'm out. Like, that was it. You know, even if I do win this battle, it's a pyrrhic victory. I can't I can't go to Port Winchester and win there. I can't, or uh, uh, Port Republic and win there. I certainly can't go to Gaines Mill and win there. So, I mean, at that point, like that's all she wrote. Um, and uh, so, you know, the rest of this series is going to be me playing the campaign at Major General with this playthrough. I may return at some juncture to Legendary. It will be a new playthrough, a different start, you know, different, um, all that stuff. And I... I, 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 I am cognizant of the fact that this is almost like a bait and switch right like i was like hey guys here's my new legendary playthrough and you know we're we're seven battles into the thing and i spent two hours bitching about shiloh <laughs> and you know apparently a couple of you watched that and uh or, or clicked through it likely you know or <laughs> fast forward the thing um apparently several of you watched that so i feel bad um from the perspective of you signed up for a legendary series and seven battles into it, it's going to be an MG series. But I was taking five or six attempts on every single battle to get to an outcome. Um, well, one, to get to a victorious outcome. And then two, to get to a victorious outcome that didn't leave me with a shell of an army. Uh, and as good as the stats were on my guys, like the training was good and I could put like a wet behind the ears major in command of a unit and they would have one star. That's all great. But when I'm going into Gaines mill and you know, uh, two thirds of my army has smooth bores muskets. It's not a good look, dude. You know, that's like, that's, uh, that's, that's like bringing, you know, uh, that's, that, that look is so last year. It's bringing the Battle of New Orleans to the the Battle of Gaines Mill. It's not a not a good look. So, uh, it, additionally, I was getting to the point where I really had a hard time getting any of my units leveled up because they were taking such horrendous losses that it I would need to refill them with rookies because I couldn't afford to do anything else. So all those things combined, the uh, I, I do not recommend 
the, the training start for a Confederate commander. Um, and I have a suspicion, a worry, a wonder if my frustration with legendary isn't more directly tied to that than anything else. Um, and it could be, it, it very well could be. Um, so it, where we're going to finish the campaign at MG. And the reason we're going to do that is I have a completed series all the way through the game at major general, uh, with the union army. Now this is the, this is the UI and AI mod. So it's basically the vanilla game. Um, but I don't yet have a full series through major general. I have, uh, for the Confederates, I have started and stopped, I think two or three times now. Uh, so I, I think it's, I'd like to finish the series and have uh, a fiasco plays of every battle in the game on both sides. And, uh, you know, when I get to the end of that, you know, if uh, Ultimate Admiral isn't out yet, we'll <laughs> we'll take a look at things. And you know, if Johnny and Panda release 1.26 of this mod or something, we'll we'll obviously reassess at that juncture as well. Um, but uh, you know, Panda and Johnny uh, have both talked about they don't think that there's going to be a major major revision of the mod anytime soon, and so. Um, yeah, this combat here is actually pretty dicey. Um, this guy charges in. I can't read his name yet, so I don't know what it is. But the guy that's fighting the Virginia Rifleman, he charges in, and I figure I outnumber him 300 by 300 men, so we should be okay. Let's go in there and, and fight. And we're at good condition, and we're a two-star unit, all that kind of stuff. And and they actually they hold on for a while. So I get worried because I don't have my commander over there. They're unsupported otherwise, you know, all that kind of stuff. But eventually my stats bear out, and thank goodness um, we get we get them. Um, things are very touch and go at this moment of the battle. At this moment, I'm I'm pretty sure I've got it, but it's on the knife edge, and it's it's it's. By which I mean I'm still pretty sure I'm going to win, but now it's on the knife edge of do you win and still have an army at the end of the day? Because victory is only so useful if you can't go to the next battle. Um, so I'm being a little careful here with some units because at this juncture, the integrity of the Union Army has obviously fallen apart, but... Uh, they're still in good cover. They've still got units kind of all over the place that have easy access to some of my squishier units. Like, I don't want, uh, for example, the Tennessee Long Rifles being shot at. Uh, and, like, like, at all, right? right? And, and right now they're trading volleys with uh, Milroy. So it's very important that we get Milroy out of here. Um... For two reasons. One, Milroy represents, you know, uh, a, a threat vector that I currently lack a heavy asset to, to challenge or counter with. Um, and, and, and two, Milroy will be able to shoot uh, the Tennessee boys, and I don't want that either. Um, similarly, we have this unit here in the uh, the back left of the map, uh, which kind of looks like Beal. So I'm assuming that's his name, but who knows? Uh, and uh, again, if we don't challenge Beal correctly, uh, he has access to my artillery. Now, a unit that small is not really a threat of the f on the flag, but it could knock out a Blake. And right now, I don't really have good access to Blakes. So you get where I'm going with this, right? Like, I got to be careful because, sure, you've turned the tide and now the weight of the battle is largely in your favor, but you could still very easily lose this battle from an operational or strategic viewpoint. Tactically, it might be a victory, but it would be Pyrrhic at best. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the AI has done a very smart thing, and honestly what I would do in their shoes too. They've fallen back into the only safe place they can, which has got 
fantastic cover, as you may imagine. So um, I'm trying to convince them that the good direction for them to go is on the day open. Uh, and that will mean shooting at them uh, shooting at them in cover and me in the open. Obviously not ideal. But hopefully I'm shooting at them from enough different directions and with artillery that we can get them to route out of the woods. And that is ultimately how it plays out. Um, the rest of the battles basically just clean up. With, like I said before, the cleanup phase is where you where you determine whether or not it's a tactical victory or a genuine, like a good victory. Um, additionally, as a note, somewhere in a little bit here in the video, uh, my girlfriend comes over and we go out and get dinner. So I pause, save. Uh, there's going to be a cut and you'll see me reloading. Uh, this is not me save scumming, but I, I show it, I leave it in the video so you know that's what's happening. And there's not some weird cut where like all of a sudden the camera jolts somewhere and and people are like, oh, he's safe scumming or oh, he's, you know, editing it uh, like two different battles together to get an ideal outcome. It's not what's happening, but it's an FYI, you know, like life happens, right? Uh, thank gosh that this game has a save function. You're right. So uh, here I, I, I task the Texas Infantry and the... Uh, Virginia Rifles with running down Beale and getting rid of him so that, that at that point the entirety of the Union Command will then be uh, condensed entirely uh, in this box, so to speak, right here. And yeah, they're in the woods and that sucks. And yeah, they're they're all bunched up and, and all that kind of stuff uh, and they might murder ball out and I'm going to take some losses on them in the open and that's also not great and whatever, whatever, whatever. It, it's it, I mean fine right like I, I agree I hear you I understand um, but at the moment what I need them to do is I need them to fall back towards that farmhouse and those two wheat fields south of their position and the only way that I can get them to move in the direction I want them to do is to bracket their position and then fire on all of these units from enough different sides with enough like different kinds of firepower uh, artillery infantry from weird angles and all that kinds of shit and just convince them that their position's untenable eventually they will fall back in the direction i want them to and then we can we can move towards cleanup um so uh i, I apologize to everybody for the time it's taken me to get from uh in between these battles from first winchester here and um you know i don't like that i i talk about it all the time i like once a week and one of the things that I think makes me feel okay about stepping down towards Major General is the fact that it 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 was a close run thing about whether or not I was going to get each episode done in the course of a week. Like I look back at the timestamps of the videos I released at the legendary portion, and, and I did barely manage to make it once a week, but it was close, and it was not always the same day. So um, as a catch up, you're going to get uh, two videos this week. This video. Uh, probably three actually. You're gonna get three videos this week. This video, a camp video, um, where we walk through the new army so you have a better idea of where we are because obviously all the camp videos up until this point are irrelevant now. And uh, and then I'm gonna go do Port Republic, which is uh, uh, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully relatively easy and hasn't significantly changed in terms of what I, what I can expect out of it. Um, we'll see, I guess, right? So, uh, and then um, I have uh, a very busy week with, with work and stuff. So it, I probably won't get to Gaines Mill until uh, next week. But you'll get the two battles leading up to it, plus a camp video this week to make up for the delay um, up until, you know, up until now. So I'm excited uh, about the MG playthrough. I'm also excited about, uh, we get to compare and contrast a couple of different styles of army construction. Um, generally speaking, you're still looking at uh, the usual broad strokes of a fiasco army. Um, so I am not as elite oriented as Panda Kraut or something Compass is. I'm not as artillery oriented as um, SC is either, but interestingly, um, 
and I'm still working through it, uh, Something Compass actually put together a, a great Confederate campaign playthrough, and he builds a very different kind of army than I've seen him build in the past. Usually he builds this very artillery-heavy um, force, and, and the Confederate series, I think, is very maneuver-oriented. So I'm, I'm excited to check that out. Like I said, still kind of working through it. Um, also go check out if you've got any, any interest in role-playing games. He's got a, a, a Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines um, video, and I believe this is the first game in the series. So it's a couple years old, the game itself, probably available fairly cheaply. Um, and I bet you could probably follow that guide along and, 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 you know, have a pretty good playthrough for yourself. Although in the first episode, SC does make it pretty clear, um, his vampire playthrough is going to be optimized. So there may not be as much room for you to like role play, uh, as much as you might like. And then in, by which I mean, make some choices that may theoretically be suboptimal, uh, from a mathematical perspective, but optimal from a telling an appropriate story for your character uh, perspective. Like if you were playing a Bruja, I wouldn't expect that character to make cold, rational decisions because that's not in the nature of a Bruja. Uh, if they're playing, you know, a Ventru, like you're not going to be slumming it, you know, and that kind of shit. Uh, so, you know, give it a shot. Um, I'm pretty excited. There's a, speaking of a uh, vampire, there's a new one coming out relatively soon. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's a indirectly a paradox, um, property that game now. Uh, and I, I like, I like paradox as a studio a great deal. None of their content really works with my format. Um, I thought about a Stellaris let's play or a CK two let's play or any of those kinds of grand strategy kind of games. Uh, apologies, I, somewhere, I guess, in this in this second recording session, I, I didn't uh, upload sound. So this back half here is going to be kind of entirely uh, without audio. Uh, but we're, there's not a whole lot left. Uh, we're about, about 10 minutes out on the rest of the video, just as a, as a heads up. So, yeah, uh, none of those games really work terribly well with my format, which is to say we go from, you know, like we, we I don't know. We, you, if you've watched my channel, you know my format. Like, <laughs> we, I, 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 I play a battle. I talk about the mechanics, the, the sort of, at least the way that I perceive them, um, and, and talk around hopefully how you can, you know, fight those battles out. Uh, but in a lot of ways, I, I think that some of that st- some of that formula has been co-opted by uh you know panda i mean panda's got these great videos and the difference between me and panda is that panda actually knows the code <laughs> right so i i can tell you what i've seen and interestingly my observations mostly line up with what the code says but um i, I you know like Panda does this wonderful job of telling you how things work under the hood in his videos that um, the tutorial element of my videos is maybe not as necessary as it used to be. Um, but, you know, we have different play styles. I play a little wider, I think, than he does. He goes very tall. Um, and I'm, yeah, anyway. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I've kind of looked at ways of, you know, how do I diversify the channel? And I think I talked about this towards the tail end of the um, the last Confederate playthrough where I was like, what do I do next? Or where do I go from here? Or that kind of deal. Uh, and and a, a lot of the voices that I saw in the commentary on that video was like, yeah, just keep playing this game. Um, just up the difficulty or find some other way to make it interesting. And uh, the JNP rebalance mod is, is kind of how I'm going to do that for now. And uh, when Ultimate Admiral comes out uh, on Steam, when they feel it's ready enough for early access on Steam, I'll start releasing content for that game. Uh, it's I know there ba- there are backer kits available for it right now. I know I could go you know buy the Admiral edition and get it and whatever. Blah 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 blah. Sure, sure I could. Um, but it's it's I mean it's not there yet. So, uh, I, I've watched some content for it. Apparently it's pretty rough. We'll say, um, all right. So here's, um, the end of the battle. We do very well, uh, in this fight, which 
you know, again, after all the times I've lost this fight, it's kind of frustrating. Um, this is what it is. Uh, and then we capture a bunch of good stuff. A lot of Springfield 61s makes me very excited. We're not going to do the camp video or go back to the camp uh, in this particular video. I'm going to do that in the next one. Uh, so I'll see you guys when we get back to camp. And until then, this is Fiasco signing out. And glad to be back.